Please open your Bibles to John chapter 20. Our text for today will be verses 1 through 18. Please follow along with me. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, And she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On Good Friday, we took a journey through the horrific sufferings of Christ. We looked at his betrayal, at his arrest, at his trial and his beatings. We looked at his floggings and his crucifixion and his death. Jesus truly suffered more than anyone else has ever suffered. But his physical agony was only a drop in the ocean of the suffering that Jesus was plunged into when the sky went black for three hours in the middle of the day and when he bore the wrath of God for our sins. All that we could ever peer into is just a small glimpse of what he went through for us. The agonies of crucifixion are nothing compared to the foaming cup of God's wrath that He drank for His people. Truly, only the Father and the Son fully know what He went through. John chapter 19 closes with a major shift in the story. Once Jesus uttered the cry, it is finished. Once the atonement had been accomplished and his sufferings were ended, the scene shifts and no longer is he being humiliated and dishonored. Formerly secret disciples now step forward and they own him, coming out into the open, coming into the light with love and allegiance to the Lord. They honored him extravagantly. The details of it are stunning. Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin, used his position to go before Pilate, the one who had just had Jesus crucified, and courageously requested for the body of Christ to be given to him. Nicodemus, also a member of the Sanhedrin and an influential Pharisee, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes with about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. They used their position and their wealth to prepare a burial fitting for the king that Jesus is. 
And then they laid his body in Joseph of Arimathea's own new stone-hewn tomb in which no one had ever been laid. So the scene shifts from suffering and shame to devotion and honor for the King of Kings. And it's here where we pick up the story of the resurrection in verse, in verse 1 of chapter 20. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, the first day of the week is Sunday, the day which Christ rose again from the grave. And ever since then, Christians have honored him on Sunday, the first day of the week, which is known as the Lord's Day. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early on the first day of the week. When she saw that the stone was rolled away, she didn't get excited and shout, He is risen, because she didn't know the end of the story yet. You see, we get excited about the stone being rolled away because we're familiar with the story. But Mary Magdalene saw the stone rolled away. She was broken when she saw it and upset. Why? Because she thought that someone had taken him. Maybe Jews or maybe grave robbers. And so she ran, and not in joy, but in fear and in distress. And she ran to Simon Peter and to an unnamed disciple who is the author of this gospel. He, he is John. And she said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So what was going on in her mind? She saw the stone rolled away and thought that someone had taken his dead body, which means that she thought Jesus was still dead. This is important for you to see because in our modern age of science, when many think that we're the smartest people to have ever walked the face of, of the earth, we tend to look back on people in ancient history as being primitive and being small in their understanding, being gullible and superstitious. But the resurrection didn't happen among a gullible people. The resurrection didn't happen amidst a culture where resurrection was normal. The resurrection happened in the same world in which we live, in a world where resurrection doesn't just happen. When Mary saw the empty tomb, she didn't conclude that Jesus had risen. She thought that he was still dead and concluded that he had been relocated. Verse 3. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. What did he see? He saw and believed. What did he believe? He saw grave clothes lying there where the body of Jesus had been. You know, this scene, it's, it's in contrast to Lazarus' resurrection from a few chapters ago in John chapter 11. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus was not raised in a glorified body, but in a body that would die again. And when he came out of the tomb, he walked out with his grave clothes on and he needed to be unbound. But Jesus was raised in a glorified body never to die again. When John looked in and he saw the grave clothes, he knew that the body of Jesus had not been stolen. There was no disorder there. The grave clothes were exactly where his dead body had been. They were undisturbed, but there was no dead body. It was as if Jesus had passed right through them, which many people believe is exactly what happened. As later on in this same chapter, on two different occasions, when the disciples are together behind locked doors, Jesus walks right in. So John saw the clothes and the way they were there, and he believed. And what he believed was that Jesus had been raised. John had this wonderful privilege of being the first person to believe 
that Jesus had risen from the dead. But he's not boasting improperly. Because look at the next verse. For as yet, they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. And you might scratch your head as you, as you read that and think, so they believed, but they didn't understand. And, and that's right, he's just being honest. Throughout his Gospel, John has pointed out the failure of the disciples to understand the words of Jesus. They didn't see the reality of it. And the lights didn't come on until after the resurrection and the empty tomb. It was after they experienced the risen Christ that the lights came on and the Scriptures came alive to them. So you've got to understand that the Word of God, it's, it's truth, and, and it's truth that's meant to set you free, but freedom isn't just the result of studying the words of Scripture. The Scripture points to the reality that must be experienced, and this is why it's so important for you to understand that you can have a clean and beautiful doctrine statement. You can write the most wonderful essays about the Christian faith. You can be well-versed in theology and rightly divide the Scriptures, as we should do, but that doesn't automatically bring freedom. This is really important because if knowing the words alone brought freedom, then you could never, ever see a Christian hypocrite. And you could never be one. A person who knows the right and walks in the wrong. Experiencing Christ in truth brings freedom. The study of truth alone doesn't automatically do so. It's not either or. It's not truth or experience. It's both and. There's, there's a difference between studying a map and, and reading road signs and experiencing the destination to which they point. You can memorize the map. You can be familiar with all the road signs, but never actually experience the destination. Yet the whole point of the map and the signs is a destination. If you fail to make that distinction, then you can end up believing that you've been to the destination even though you've only looked at the map. How many people think they know Christ well because they're familiar with things in the Bible? That's not the same thing is experiencing the reality of the living Christ. The disciples went back to their homes and the scene shifts back to Mary. She had been to the tomb. She had seen that the stone was rolled away and she had feared that somebody had taken him and so she had ran to tell the other disciples. They ran ahead of her to the tomb where they saw and they believed and they went home. And it seems like she had been left behind in all of this because she ends up not knowing what's going on going back to the tomb where she just stands there weeping. Now, before we go any further, who is Mary Magdalene? If you read the Gospels, you will find her mentioned at the death of Christ. You'll find her mentioned at the resurrection of Christ. And you'll find her mentioned in one other comment in Luke's Gospel where we're told that from her seven demons had gone out in chapter 8, verse 2. You may have heard that she was a prostitute, but you can't find that in the Bible. What we do know is that she had seven demons cast out of her. Jesus had done so much for her, and she had so much love for him in return. She would have been broken beyond words as she stood outside of that tomb. She doesn't understand why the stone is rolled away. She doesn't understand why his body is not there. She can't stay away. She she just stands there where Jesus' dead body had been, and she weeps. Verse 11, But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? It's it's like they gave her a gentle rebuke or a correction here. Like, this is not crying time. 
What are you, what are you crying for? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she didn't know that it was Jesus. Now, some speculate that maybe the angels pointed or that maybe she heard a sound. We don't know, but she turned around and she saw Jesus. She saw him, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. With the call of her name, he turns the lights on. He, he takes the scales from her eyes and, and her sorrow is turned to joy and her weeping is turned into laughter. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. He called her name and he gave her sight. What a beautiful thing. You see, Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them. We're seeing that right here. And when she is beside herself in brokenness and she can't even see the Lord is right in front of her, he speaks her name and he opens her eyes. Now verse 17 says, Jesus said to her, don't cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, this is an interesting verse to unpack. Because if you start reading through different commentaries and try to figure out what this means, you're going to find different answers and ideas about this. But I think that the simplest way to understand this is... Jesus is not telling Mary that she can't touch his body because doing so would somehow defile him. In just a few verses in the same chapter, he's going to tell Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, and put, your hand, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So he's going to invite Thomas to touch him so I don't think that Mary is going to somehow ruin the plan or defile him if she touches him. Jesus has conquered sin and death and that can never be ruined or undone in any way. It seems more likely that when her eyes were opened and she saw him, that she just threw herself at his feet and grabbed a hold of him, clinging, never wanting to let go. The one that she... Th loved more than anything and that she thought that she had lost forever was all of a sudden in front of her, alive. And so maybe in her fear, she didn't want to risk losing him again, so she just latched onto him, clinging, never wanting to let go. So Jesus said to her, don't cling to me. Why? For I have not yet ascended to, my father, to the Father, but go to my brother's and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary, it's not time to be holding on to me. I've not ascended yet. Take this news to the brothers. We're told in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, that he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Over the next 40 days, Jesus would appear to his disciples and speak to them about the kingdom of God. So Jesus tells her not to cling to him, not now, but go and take what she's seen and heard and share it. And she does. And now she's running. 
not with a sad message, not with fear in her heart and a worry message, but with a joyful message of good news. Mary Magdalene, verse 18, went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that He had said these things to her. But look back at verses 1 and 2. I want to point out something to you here. We hear these words, and we're used to the story. We know what goes on. We know who went where and who said what, and we're familiar with it. But I want you to just stop for a second, look at verses 1 and 2, and I want you to notice who the first two people are who are named here. Mary Magdalene and Simon Peter. A woman who is barely mentioned in the Bible, who is totally in the background, and who obviously had some serious baggage somewhere in her past to end up with seven demons. She is honored as being the first person to see Jesus alive in John's Gospel. That is enormously exciting. We're used to heroes. We're used to people who who make it and earn it and find their place by their own power, their own wit, and their own success. Those are the people who are honored. Yet here is one who was enslaved and in darkness, but Jesus set her free and she loved him for that. She's not the hero. He is. She loved him because he first loved her. Her and he set her free. And now she's honored as being the first to see him risen. Who else is honored? Simon Peter. One day Jesus got into Simon's boat and sat down in it to teach the people from. And then he told Peter to set out for a catch, and Peter was reluctant at first, but he agreed. And he experienced a miraculous catch to which he responded when he saw it by falling down at Jesus' knees and saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter followed Christ and eventually came to think of himself as a, as a faithful disciple who, even if he had to die, would never deny Jesus. But on the night when Jesus was betrayed, Peter denied Jesus three times. Yet he is honored as the first to go into the empty tomb. He's not the hero. Jesus is. And his grave is is even a place where where his grace is, is just displayed. So often we make it the other way around. Spirituality, it becomes like this ladder, you know, and and if you just run fast enough or jump far enough or climb high enough, and, and if you're just awesome enough, God will honor you. He'll really honor you if you can show your stuff. But look at who's honored here. Jesus told Mary, go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Sometimes you just need to stop and sit a while in words like that. My brothers. (laughs) Jesus, do you mean the ones that in your greatest hour of need that they couldn't, they couldn't watch and pray, but were sleeping? And then when you got arrested and bound and taken in, that they all fled, forsook you and fled? You mean these ones? Jesus, do you mean the, one, the ones that you taught for three years and still at this very moment, they, they don't understand the things that you, that you told them? You mean these? Your brothers? Yes. My brothers... Tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father. Now, if God is their Father, what does that make them? It makes them children of God. Children of God. So Jesus sends Mary to those who had just forsaken Him and fled. And He calls them His brothers and He calls them God's children. This is something you have to understand. The hero of the Christian faith is not great Christians. The hero of the Christian faith is the Christ of our faith. He is the hero. He does the rescuing. Now, one word that is repeated all over this passage is the word 
saw. There's something so important about this. It shows up again and again. And it's important because Christianity is not simply about knowing about Jesus. It's seeing through the eyes of faith. So today I want to ask a question, and it is a question, do you see? Because in this story, Mary saw the stone rolled away. And she even saw Jesus standing right in front of her. But she didn't get it. She didn't see. Until he spoke her name and the lights came on. And then she saw. So do you see? I want want you to understand that studying the scriptures matters greatly to our faith. And I don't want to take anything away from diligent study. In fact, I, I strongly encourage it. But if you reach the summit of understanding the truth and you never encounter or experience the Christ to whom it all points, then what's the point? It's like studying a map and never going to where it points. The question could be asked to us as well, whom are you seeking? Because we're not just merely meant to be collectors of Christian facts. We're to be seekers of the living God. And the facts are meant to lead us somewhere. Just like with Mary, the fact of the empty tomb didn't just stay a fact. At first, it upset her and she didn't understand. But it led to her falling at the feet of Christ and holding on and never wanting to let go. And then it led to her being sent to share the good news to the encouragement of others. You know, this is challenging. Because as Christians, we must seek after God. We must be in His Word. We must be in prayer. We must do these things regularly. There are certain spiritual disciplines that that must be practiced with diligence. But it's also easy to fall into the cycle of going through the motions, of having these things in place. But the desire begins to wane and fall off. You know, it's right to discipline yourself to daily time with the Lord. It's not right to neglect that. But the question must be asked, whom are you seeking? Is it just a check in the box on the list of Christian duties? Or is it the means of seeing someone who is infinitely worthy of seeing? A.W. Tozer describes faith as the gaze of the soul upon a saving God. The gaze of the soul upon a saving God or the sight. The scriptures are written to help us with our sight to help us to see and the spiritual disciplines are the necessary means of coming to see and to experience Christ. What made all the difference for Mary was when Jesus called her name and opened her eyes to the one who was right in front of her. And that's exactly what we need when the word is open before us, for God to open our eyes to what is right in front of us. We need to pray for God to warm our hearts and to open our eyes. This is what will carry you throughout your life, throughout the highs and the lows. It's what will comfort you on your lowest and darkest days. This is what will strengthen you for real good works and service to Christ. You see, God knows our performance-driven, check-the-box-off ways of how we can go about so much of our Christian life. And you know what? He'll let you do that. Maybe some of you are feeling stuck in a rut like that right now. And, And I want to tell you something. God will let you do that for a while. And your heart will get cold, and everything will feel dry and empty. But if you are His... He'll use that to make you hate your sin and long for Him more. He'll use that to make you hate that you can be so much more easily impressed by the world than the God who made it 
and cause you to cry out to Him for grace. And then, in response to your longings and cries, He'll come and meet with you and give you fresh tastes of His love and His mercy. You see, He's not going to let you be the hero of your own story. And that's why I love this passage, because He gives the great privilege of seeing Him of seeing him first to an obscure woman who all we really know about her is that she had been delivered from great bondage, from seven demons, and that she loved Jesus greatly. And that's it. And that's that's what matters. Faith working through love. He delivered her. She believed and she loved him. That's what matters. And if you have so much of the other external things going on, you don't have those things in the right place, then what does it matter? It's not either or. The question is not how much do you know about theology or do you know about the things of God? The question is, have you been delivered by Jesus Christ from your sins and bondage? Has that happened to you? And have your eyes been opened to see and to delight in Jesus Christ as the most precious treasure? That's what matters. This is not about being well-behaved and religious, making sure the external looks right. And we have a spirituality about us. This is about Christ and experiencing Him and having an encounter with Him that changes the heart and life about Him being precious to us. It is about faith in Him and love for Him. Jesus Christ is risen. He is alive today and the tomb is empty and that is wonderful news. Because Jesus Christ is infinitely worthy of being seen. He is. He is. So immerse yourself in seeking Him through God's Word. Asking Him to open your eyes to see and to experience Christ in what's right in front of you. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Father, your word is truth. It is a lamp to our feet. It is light to our path. Your word is truth, O God. And by it, we are made free. And by it, we can be sanctified and grow in knowing and experiencing Christ. God, give us a hunger for your word, a hunger to know you, a hunger to study to show ourselves approved, but not just to know about you, God, but that through it we would encounter you more, having our eyes opened more to the beauty of who you are. Father, I pray for those listening who are not saved, who have not been delivered from their bondage and sin. Maybe they have a religious veneer to their life, or maybe they don't. I just, I just pray for those who are lost, God, who aren't in a right standing before you, who aren't ready for death. I, I pray that you, would, that, you would give them, that you would give them faith, that you would raise them to new spiritual life, that you'd cause them to be born again, that you'd give them eyes to see the glory and beauty of Christ, to believe upon Him, to turn from sin and trust in Him, and to delight in Him. And I pray for those who are saved. Father, that you would make Jesus more precious to us. Give us a greater longing and desire. Father, open our eyes to your word and to the beauty of your Son. Give us longings after him, to love him, to follow him, and to be like him. Lord, conform us into his image and likeness. God, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the empty tomb. In Jesus' name.
Amen.